I turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when she I... She says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Kim... Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing... born and raised in Scotts Bluff 70 years ago. Or we did two separate tours of duty in Washington, D.C. One of, oh dear, I can't remember, one of five years and one of eight, except for that, I lived in Nebraska. And after high school in Scotts Bluff, came to Lincoln for college and have lived here ever since, as half the town, I think, has. I've thought about that a lot, about how, how the geography and our environment influences whatever you do. And it's hard to find connections, except that I gave a talk a year ago in Scotts Bluff during their centennial about how growing up in the panhandle of Nebraska influenced us in those rather innocent times, um, 60, 55 years ago. Um, there was no TV, no internet, all our drugs were legal. Um, hardly anybody had cars. Boys could borrow their father's, car, the family car. Um, so we did things together. Uh, you know, we climbed the bluffs and we went to Lake Minotaur and we picnicked in the Wildcat Hills as if this were our own paradise, as if there weren't anything special about it. But it was very enclosed and our lives, I think, were, were far richer for it. When I first came to eastern Nebraska to go to the university, I could hardly stand the hills. And, I, you know, you don't probably think of eastern Nebraska as hilly, but you couldn't see to the horizon anymore, and I just hated that. Now, when I get just a little ways past North Platte, then my whole body just goes, oh, finally. I love, I love being in western Nebraska. I don't particularly want to live there. I love living in Lincoln. Um, and I'm so deeply rooted here in Nebraska that it's almost impossible for me to describe how that unconscious effect plays out in my day-to-day -day writing. You know, often uh, writers or people are asked who are their big influences, and they have these great glowing answers about wonderful people that have influenced them. <clears throat> I read constantly, but I can't, I can't say, uh, you know, I can't name you the great writers of history who have influenced me at all. Um, years ago, I read everything that May Sarton wrote because I like to write the same kind of thing. Uh, nonfiction, first person, um, just nonfiction, first person. Um, but I read so much that it would be hard for me to pick out a specific, a specific influence. I think maybe... Um, my family growing up may have been a larger influence. <clears throat> At some point, somebody said to me, well, you, you can write, or you need to write, or you must write. And I just put that hat on right away. Always knew exactly what I wanted to do, always. Um, worked for the Lincoln Star, and I've worked for the World Herald, and I worked for KOLN TV, and I worked at KFOR. So I've been connected with media for a long time. I've probably been writing all my adult years, but some more than, more than others. Um, it's kind of hard to have three children and, and a full political life, which I always had with Charlie, and, and do any kind of significant writing. I would say that probably the last 20, 25 years, I've been a serious writer. Now I know that I have to do it. If I go several days without writing, I just I just get spinning off the planet and think everything is somebody else's fault. And, and if I'm writing, all the little stuff just falls away and I'm okay. So you satisfy that. This, you satisfy the burning urge to write by writing. Uh, um, I did workshops for a while leading people through what you can do about your life so that you can write. You know, there's always another load to fold from the dryer or some reason why you can't get your writing done. And so we just spent two or three hours looking at your life and saying, if I really want to write, 
Where can I work that into my life? And that's been a lot of fun to do. That's been helpful to me, too, because there were a number of years when I wasn't, I probably had other things to do, other calls on my time. But I'm much better now about attending to what I know I must do. And there is a burning urge to write. I agree with that. Almost anything. Almost anything is grist for the mill. Um, a conversation, uh, a story, I start hearing it go on in my head, and I think, oh, well, I am so tired of that. I'm going to go sit down and write it. And I, uh, I think if, if I don't respond to that, then they'll stop. The ideas will stop coming. So I think I have to just keep, whatever's going on in my head, I have to get to my computer and sit down and write it. Oh, I think I'm probably a, I'm not really a one-note writer, but I only write first-person nonfiction. That's all I know how to write. I couldn't, I couldn't write a, a, a fiction story if I had to. I, I simply couldn't do it. But, but I've been writing this way for so long, sometimes columns for newspapers, and in the three books that I have published, I have taken up something I need to know about or something I need to explore. And I work through it by writing. You know, a lot of people work through things by needle pointing or cleaning the garage or, or getting a new partner. I work through stuff by writing. I did Women in Aging when I became aware of my own aging. And I had never grown up around uh, older people. And I wrote uh, Fat, A Fate Worse Than Death, when I t changed from size 10 to size 20 and larger. I, I, I have to work my way through things. The uh, manuscript that's going in and out of my office right now is on death and dying. But I have discovered that in looking back, I've been writing about death and dying for a long time without knowing I was. Um, in our writing group on Monday afternoons, it, w somebody would suggest a subject and then we write on it. And one time I know that somebody suggested football. And my piece ended up being how I had gotten used to the sound of TV football in our home because that reminded me that my husband was still alive. I mean, so everything just goes uh, right back now to the subject of death and dying. Anything gets there. Gosh, I wish my method of writing were a little, a little bit more professional. Uh, afternoon, early evening. Early evening is really a wonderful time for me. I know that's strange, but I sleep later than most people. Um, and I just go sit down at my computer and start writing. Writing something, you know, is the easy job. Editing it is hard. Um, marketing it is hard. If I could just sit at my computer and write, that would be wonderful, thank you. Writing is very easy for me, and I have a friend who says, that I write like a, a city hall reporter on deadline. He thinks I would be better if I slowed down a little. It's just me, and I don't think that has changed. I think when I try to be something other than who I am, then it looks artificial or patronizing or wrong. Uh, so I just have one voice. I wish I had more than one. I just have one voice, and it's, it's as the as essays I have written, so many essays I can't even count them, uh, on, on anything, on you know, the children growing up or driving in western Nebraska or anything, anything. I can, that's what we did in our writing group for so many years. Somebody would name one word and we would write for 25 minutes on that one word. Every once in a while it was a little difficult, but hardly at all, hardly at all. Probably if I write for anybody, I write for women. I don't do that intentionally, but the subjects of two of my three books are about women. Although Death and Dying, the new one, the manuscript, is not about you know men or women at all. That's the deal that we all get with life. Um, it, so at, at this point in my life, older people is clearly my audience. I write a, a bi, uh, monthly, bi-monthly, is that twice a month? By monthly column for the neighborhood extra. And it's, I mean, without even thinking about it, I write about old age. I mean, that's certainly the audience, one of the audiences for the neighborhood extra, and it's clearly one of my audiences today. For instance, the Women in Aging book, the message was that we must take 
affirmative action in order not to feel badly about ourselves as old women in the culture of the United States. And the same was true for the book Fat, A Fate Worse Than Death. We have this terrible, terrible, terrible idea in the United States that every woman should be the objects of, of somebody's affection because she's thin and young. Um, and so, of course, I had a message in, in that book. That was really clear. Um, in the death and dying work, I don't know that there is a message because I can't certainly tell anybody to look at it the same way I do. I mean, we can't do that. Uh, we all have to figure out what works for us, what makes sense, what comforts us, I think. I just encourage people to write. Everybody says, oh, well, I'm not a writer. Well, you don't have to be published to be a writer, and that doesn't have to be the goal. The, the goal has to be satisfying some inner urge or doing what you know you're supposed to be doing. It's very easy for me to encourage people to write. If you write, you're a writer. And I think when you're writing, you must not worry about, oh, who's going to publish this? You can do that later. And I think it's very hard for people who are writers to suddenly become marketers. Now, some people just strike it lucky, and some people don't. Um, it's very, very hard to be published these days. You can't get your work into a publishing house unless you have a, oh, the word escapes me, um, agent. And I have never had an agent. Um, publishing has changed so, as, as obviously you at the library know. But for instance, a large publishing company buys shelf space in a bookstore. Large publishing companies buy um, uh, the attention of the distributor. Uh, so the little presses are really being pushed out. and. People who aren't big, famous authors are having a terrible time getting published. But I guess you just have to keep at it and find whatever venue you can. I, I'm, really, I'm really as illiterate about marketing as I am about my computer, that I have to be just, I mean, I'm fine with my computer now, but I'm trying to learn a new one. And it's just very hard for me. <laughs> So I'm um, the whole issue of selling a book is just a mystery to me. But you know the two that Hayworth published, Hayworth did Women and Aging and Fat, and they looked at the Death and Dying manuscript and they liked it very much. And Bill uh, Palmer said, "This should be published. This is worth reading." And but they only have a gay and lesbian list and a women's list, so a Death and Dying manuscript wouldn't work wouldn't work for them, so that's why I'm out on the street peddling. It's, it's really an, in, I write intuitively. Um, and I've always been verbal, and so I have a large vocabulary to reach for. Um, so finding the right word to, you know, it's hard for an author to say, oh, well, yes, I found the right word because somebody else might think, what in heaven's name was she trying to say? So I think you have to let the audience know whether or not you have found the right word, where someone to say, oh yeah, I felt like that too. Um, even though I try to do my best, I don't have, my children used to say to me, mom, we know what you're trying to say, but somebody else might not. So I do have to be careful that I don't run too fast. and. Half of the of the knowing of the reading is in my brain and hasn't gotten itself onto the paper. No, that I ever go anywhere, that somebody doesn't say, "Oh, you know, I saw a picture of you once," or "I heard that you slid down the banister at the governor's mansion," as if it's going to be a surprise to me that they know about it. Uh, it was a wonderful, um, serendipitous, um, and unplanned occasion. Um, the girls and I had flown to Lincoln from Washington, where we were still living. Charlie had been in the Congress for eight years. And this was the day before we'd flown here and, and walked into the governor's mansion to live. Although the, no, only Amy lived here. The big girls were in college by then. And after Charlie had been given his talk and all that sort of thing and being sworn in in the afternoon, we'd gone back to the mansion to change clothes, have a bite to eat, to get ready for the party and stuff that night. 
And Gail Folda from the journal came over, who's a friend, and her parents are close friends. And we were just horsing around. And I was sliding down the banister, and Gail took a picture, not, uh, not secretly. I mean, I knew she was taking it, and I didn't care. And I didn't think a thing of it until it was in something a few days later. And some, some of the people who voted for Charlie were offended. <laughs> but I, got, I must have gotten 200 letters. It, they put it on the wire, and it went across the nation. And so I got these wonderful letters from people telling me what they do. Uh, as adults to keep the child alive in them. And that was the wonderful part of the whole experience for me. Well, same, same old subject. I will be reading tonight from my Death and Dying manuscript, the first half of which um, it was just me writing about some subjects about the religion in which I was raised, uh, what I think about uh, life after death, uh, all sorts of issues around death and dying. And then, um, about a month after I finished that 15th chapter, I had a brain aneurysm. And so it was several months before I was writing consistently again on this manuscript. So the first half is just general. And the second half is recovering from brain injury or not recovering from brain injury and uh, figuring out how to do life under, under new rules, vastly changed circumstances. So I'm going to read from both of those, little pieces from both of those. Good evening. My name is Joanna Lloyd, and I'm the curator of the Heritage Room. Welcome to the James Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors and the John H. Ames Reading Series. The Heritage Room is a special collection dedicated to preserving and promoting works by and about Nebraska authors. Currently, we maintain a collection of over 11,000 volumes written by more than 3,000 published authors in Nebraska. And I'd like to say that we keep learning every couple of weeks about someone new that we didn't know before. Somebody comes in or calls in or tells us about someone. In an effort to promote these authors, the Heritage Room sponsors the John A. James Reading Series as one of its efforts. I would like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because it, because it is through an endowment established through their volunteer efforts that we are able to bring you programs like these. You should feel that you can come in to visit our collection during regular public service hours for individual tours or to enjoy the Heritage Room as a reading room when, where anyone who is interested can come in and read from our collection. Our reader this evening is Ruth Thone, whom most of you probably know. Ruth Thone has been some of the most and best of wifely roles, having been wife to Nebraska Congressman and then Governor Charles Thone, living in the governor's mansion for a term and raising three daughters. Except for her years in Washington, D.C., she has lived all her life in Nebraska. She has a degree in journalism and has worked as a journalist and as a freelance writer. In addition, she has been one of the founders of both The Gathering Place and the friends of Lauren Isley. For me, to read her writing is to find points of connection between how she has lived her life and how I have lived mine. When this seems most true, I can usually trace the connections to a thought or, or observation particularly well expressed. She has written, Women and Aging, Celebrating Ourselves, Being Home, and Fat, A, face worse than, a Fate Worse Than Death. Tonight, she'll be reading from a manuscript of which the subject is death and dying. It should be interesting to hear Ruth Thone. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's lovely. Hello. Um, this is my water and this is yours, Tarana. OK. <laughs> um, I have a death and dying manuscript that's being shipped in and out of my office trying to find a publisher at this point. So that's what I'll read from. The first half of this manuscript that's that high, uh, I wrote just some thoughts, my thoughts on death and dying, of which I have about 10 a minute and always have had. For some reason, it's just a subject I have been drawn to, obviously something I needed to explore for myself. 
Um, the second half of the manuscript is written after I had a brain aneurysm start to burst and had brain surgery. And it's about um, learning to do life after your former life is no longer possible and, and the steps along the way and my growing knowledge that one doesn't recover from brain injury. One lives with it and learns how to accept that. <clears throat> but it was a near-death experience, so I felt that it matched the manuscript that was underway, and it may not, who knows. Um, I also have included in it some things that I had written uh, a long time ago. I looked back through all my stuff, about 25 or 30 years worth of stuff, and discovered that I'd been writing about death and dying for a very long time. In our, um, in our writing group, someone would mention a subject and then we'd write for 25 minutes on that. And somebody mentioned football once, and of course my piece ended up being about coming to terms with hearing the television broadcasting football in our house and becoming to like that sound as I sat out in the kitchen trying to escape from it because it meant that my husband was still alive. So you mentioned football, and I can turn it into death and die. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, this one is called The Last Dance, and this is one of the old pieces. But I put some of the old pieces in this manuscript. How dare you tell me that? I screamed at my husband in the car. How dare you? How dare you? I kept on as he kept on driving me home from the airport. Don Raymond died, he had said, reporting the unexpected death of a beloved cousin albeit one I'd seen only once since we were children. My husband understood that I was killing the messenger, instant grief made endurable by anger and denial. At ages 63 and 71, back then we are now 70 and 78, we both knew the increasing losses of friends and family and understood each other's bizarre, bizarre reactions, ways of living with the fact of aging life. What made me so horror-struck at the news of this cousin's death? This lawyer who lived 400 miles away and whose adult family I had never bothered to know. What unsuspected grief catapulted me into mourning for somebody I no longer knew? When we were teenagers, my sisters and I adored our boy cousins, but we did not fall in love with them because that bordered on incest, even though we were just third cousins. They were our surrogate brothers, commenting on all our boyfriends and not hesitating to tell us which ones they considered unacceptable. And we danced together on Saturday nights at the dances at the Mitchell Fairgrounds Pavilion. Three of the boy cousins were good dancers. Jitterbug and slow dancing are only options in that time long before rock and roll loosened up the world. We didn't have dates with our cousins, we just got to dance with them even if we'd gone to Mitchell with a boyfriend. Maybe this memory has become golden with age and desire, since neither my sisters nor I married men who could or liked to dance. A big, awful joke in the household of my growing up was that Dad would hang onto the fireplace mantle and kick his feet and call that dancing. <laughs> my mother, too, once danced with lots of boys, loving that part of her pre-marriage life but those boy cousins could dance, none better than Don Raymond. I guess I harbored the thought that over all those years, secret even to myself, that he and I would dance again, would be teenagers together again at the Mitchell Fairgrounds of a Saturday night, his red hair and freckled face gleaming with sweat, his hands and arms telling me exactly what to do, his body and legs moving surely and in perfect rhythm our dancing not messed up with any romantic notions about one another. Whatever led me to live in that fantasy, a fantasy I didn't even admit to myself, that Don and I would dance again, that we could return to those innocent selves, our cousin selves, safe in that western valley. Once during those 40 years that we did not know each other, I did a terrible thing. I even hate to read this. <laughs> In recovery from alcoholism myself and hearing that he was a big drinker, I visited him at his law office when I was in our old hometown on business. He treated me kindly, perhaps baffled at this 
self-righteous cousin telling him how great sobriety was. Our family had always felt superior to his. My father's being a lawyer, his father before him a lawyer, making us sort of a top dog in the economic pecking order. The fact that my father didn't lose any love on his relatives and spent most of his adult life addicted to codeine did little to abuse us and in fact perhaps was responsible for our perspective of elevated status. Anyway, that was stupid of me to do. I always asked people from the valley if they knew Don and how was he. I guess I'd heard he was sick. He had had colon cancer a few years before he died, which recurred in a year or two and spread in a matter of months over his body. Wanting more information about his death and the announcement in the Bar Association Journal, I called one of his former law partners. He never had a bad word to say about anyone, he reported of his old friend. He was the nicest guy I ever knew. All I knew came from my old memories, nothing from his adult life. I called his wife, Virginia, finally. She told me of their last years and months. Their doctor told Don to get his affairs in order and predicted that he had between three to six months to live. He died in five months. He and Virginia working hard to get his personal and professional affairs in order. A registered nurse, she had been his office partner during his last years practicing law on his own. She was his partner at home, installing a hospital bed in the living room, <clears throat> sleeping on the sofa, giving him his IVs, and taking tender care of him. I asked her if they danced throughout their married life. Oh, all the time, she responded. We belonged to two dance clubs and went dancing a lot. During those last months, Don asked Virginia, do you think we'll ever dance again? She suggested they try it right then. And so he got up and managed two or three steps, falling back into bed, exhausted. So Don and Virginia had their last dance. He and I never had a last dance, except in my coming to know in old age that I remembered all my life as if it were yesterday. Our dances at the Mitchell Fairgrounds and cherishing beyond my own knowing that cousin beloved of my childhood. Um, I'll just plow through this. I will not make um, excuses <laughs> for it, I guess. Um, <clears throat> this is a poem that I wrote a long time ago. What will death, what will it look like? That death I know will come. A vague, ethereal, even morphine-clouded time of gradual lights out? Or a wrenching instant of pain, of hitting the ground, of a heart or brain imploding into nothingness? My father grinned at me from his body ravaged by codeine, alone and pathetic in a veteran's hospital a hundred miles away, that last time a Thanksgiving before the final coma and death on January 4th. My sister Jane affected a noble stance, actually truly courageous until the pain and the devastation of cancer and radiation and chemotherapy kept her sleeping, sitting up, and not eating or talking very much. My mother was agitated, scared, trying so hard to keep everything in order, smile and be of no bother, observed by me and my sister and hospice helpers. Mother, my three girls say, we hope dad dies before you because your death would kill him. I agree. That is human arrogance to consign another to helplessness. I build a dike against my own helplessness by hoping to know ahead of time, the time of my death, die without fear or panic or drugs that blur my mind. Good luck, huh? And feel some sense of closure that I did what I was here for. Okay, this is one of the pieces from the second part of the book. In fact, I think all the rest of these are. Hmm. Friday night at the reunion was warm and lovely, friends greeting friends, remembering each other's names and faces, huddling close to one another during supper under the dripping roof of an outdoor pavilion as a western storm full of thunder and lightning and wind and sheets of rain swept over and blessed us. By Saturday afternoon, a cold wind blew across my heart bringing pain I knew aspirin would not stop, leaving a harsh reality not present the night before. 
As my sister and her husband and I drove up the Park Service Road to the top of the bluff, that enormous sandstone pine ridge that rimmed our high western valley, I told them we were all crazy to be so in love with people we had not seen for years, people we'd not kept in touch with, people with whom we had only the accident of geography in common. We had gone away having occasional fond or not so fond memories of our high school classmates and sweethearts and spent up to 50 years creating another life, a life without them. So what were we enacting as we greeted about 80 people we'd known a long time ago during this, this our 50th reunion? Regret, denial, good manners, sentiment, a wish to return to our childhoods, a way to be together without intimacy, knowing that most of us would go home and not see one another again? Who knows? This particularly American custom of reunions is popular with some. A frightening weekend for others, a sociological interesting process for others, an exercise in reminiscence mostly difficult for those classmates who still live there and are willing to be one more reunion committee. I had attended a few earlier reunions, at one time swearing I would never go to any, finally going to my 30th and then truly enjoying the 40th and 45th reunions of our graduating class in that western Nebraska town where we grew up in the 40s and 50s. On the top of the bluff that day, I found an ache in the middle of myself, felt a cold, distant, awful heartache in this place I had always loved, to which I'd driven lots of times over the years on trips back to the valley. The sound of the wind blowing through the pines on top of the bluff that I'd always loved made the ache worse, and was, I knew, simply the sound of loneliness. My sister and her husband and I walked up the path to the viewing place at the edge of the bluffs, looking north and east down the valley, pointing out to each other buildings and places that we recognized from up there. In a few short minutes, I was ready to go to climb back into their van and drive down the bluff into town the back way through Mitchell Pass, anxious for whatever memories were triggered that afternoon to be ignored, run from. That night I misread the schedule and we got to the banquet too late to get seats with our old best friends, another accident of fate that increased my sense of hurt and being left out. The evening was good but difficult. Each person spoke briefly and at my turn I began crying, knowing that that would embarrass my husband. We left soon after the official festivities were over, missing, I mourned later, some visiting time with people I especially wanted to reconnect with. That might not have happened had we stayed. It might just have been more of the same, a connection held suspended in this weekend out of 50 years. Who were the old friends with whom I longed for some heart-to-heart -heart connection? Trying to sleep that night, I recognized that my new current physical and emotional limitations after my hip replacement followed by a brain aneurysm eight months before, left me without my old ways of handling social interactions. Before, I was physically strong, able to visit around cocktail gatherings with vigor, able to talk and laugh with ease, able to relate to others with little hesitation. Now I had to sit down a lot, second-guessed myself after any social event, and felt shy and ill at ease. We live, we grow, we change. Life does not stay the same, thank God, and neither do we if we are lucky. But what a shock to discover that without the external abilities of busyness and energy, I was left with the feelings, not able to pretend that everything was fun and fine as it was, but not in me. As we drove back home the next day on an exquisite early fall Sunday afternoon, I was grateful to be back inside myself, not picking at the outside world to make me feel better, but still feeling pain over everything and everyone I missed at the reunion. I was deeply aware that I had some thinking to do about how life was then and now. Monday's thinking brought me to a beginning understanding that less is more, that not having satisfied my expectations or longings was not necessarily wrong or bad or irredeemable, that perhaps I could be satisfied with less. The words of Nebraska writer Wright Morris became almost a mantra in the days following. As I remembered, he wrote that a visit back to his childhood places left him with the ache of a nameless longing. 
That's what I felt on top of the bluffs. What I felt so strongly during the next few days and what I had not known until late in my 60s. Finally knowing the limitations of life, always present before and only now undeniable in a slightly disabled and recovering body and mind. Here's a part I just pulled out this afternoon, so I may stumble through it. This one's called To Savor Precious Life. Should I have never clambered through that closet under the eaves in my office and found those old letters and read them? Oof, who knows? I sit here at my computer, five yellowed pages, lying to the side, written in 1984 to my husband, my mother, and my three daughters as I took off for a week's Witness for Peace trip to Nicaragua. In those years, the U.S.-sponsored Contra forces were infiltrated into the northern mountains of that Iowa-sized Central American country, manning the border between Nicaragua and Honduras and shooting and killing in, over to, in order to overthrow the Sandinista government triumphant in 79. Thus I wrote to my family, if I do not return letters. And I've never looked at them from that day to this, 14 years later. I told them how much they meant to me, that I did not travel to Nicaragua to be martyred, but that if a stray bullet or landmine got me or us, that I did not mean to cause them pain and did in fact love them very much. Reading those letters now has left me hyperventilating, sad, wishing for the clarity of those years, the almost buoyant feeling of setting off on an adventure. My radical politics and acting independently and publicly in enormous difference from my conservative politician husband was a giant step for me into a brave new world of claiming for myself in late, middle, and old age, of claiming myself for late, middle, and old age. And we had to consider that we might not return, a little melodramatic. I remember those days and weeks before our little group of Nebraskans, mostly peace activists yet strangers to one another before the trip, took off for our eight days of standing for peace and justice in a poor country war ravaged by the United States. Does that sound familiar? Every lamppost looked precious, took on some significance for me it had not possessed before, if in fact I'd even noticed it. The lamppost on the corner where I turned from my neighborhood toward town. The street became special. Everything I saw was tinged with the feeling that I might never see it again, thus becoming larger and sweeter than it really was. Arthur Schopenhauer reminds us in studies in pessimism that every parting gives a foretaste of death. The banal version of that is how everything listed in the newspaper in my town looks good to me as I plan to leave for a few days or weeks. Every Wednesday night's television schedule looked so exciting to me throughout all those years that our Gathering Place mission group met every single Wednesday night. <laughs> Later, I discovered that there wasn't much I wanted to watch on Wednesday nights <laughs> outside of the National Basketball Association season. This confrontation with death, Abraham Maslow instructs, makes everything look so precious, so sacred, so beautiful, that I feel more strongly than ever the impulse to live it, to embrace it, and to let myself be overwhelmed by it. This quote tops the uh, March 26th page in One More Day, Daily Meditations for the Chronically Ill. The trees are greener and the sky is bluer. Uh, Sephra, I can't write your last name, Pizzelli, writes about when we are ill and faced, forced to face our own mortality. I read this little book myself these days, originally buying two, one for my middle daughter who has Crohn's disease, which in crisis or remission reminds her that her life might be shortened by that incurable illness of the immune system and that she has to live differently than people who don't have chronic diseases and that often friends and family do not understand what she endures and copes with. I doubt that she reads her copy. What we think another needs is exactly meant for oneself. Now my joints worn, some full of pain of arthritis and my digestive system on ready alert to send me notice of overbearing stress or food it does not like, I find pages addressed to the chronically ill, 
If they are not a perfect fit for my life, they are comforting and reminders that I can accept to help keep self-pity at bay. So what is precious when we think we will not have it anymore? Daily life with someone whose irritations we have verbally cataloged for years? <laughs> the resentments that have justified estrangement from someone else? The petty annoyances that everyone deals with every day? Stephen Butterfield, who is now dead, wrote in The Sun years ago about his own debilitating illness. He wrote, superfluity must go. What is superfluous? Anger that freezes into resentment, jealousy, greed, gossip, ego clinging, pretense, embarrassment, any form of fixation, running after pleasures, the discursive thought that maintains the storyline of me. These things are very costly in terms of the life energy that it takes to keep them going. I suspect Stephen Butterfield made some headway on that. We all know people whose cancer or heart attack changes how they do their lives, usually with more simplicity, more gratitude, more ease. Bernie Siegel finds it useful to let people know they will die. If you learn and really accept the fact that you are mortal, then you may begin to make some changes in your life, Siegel said in Omaha in the spring of 98. Now that you realize you have limited time here, why continue to be miserable? I'd say this is the major factor in my life that keeps me happy. He says, many people who learn they are mortal and have a life-threatening illness find self-esteem, self-worth. People have written, thank God I have cancer. It gives them permission. If I can get people to accept the fact that they are mortal, they are more likely to take action if something is hurting them. If they hate their job, why stay in it? If I can inspire them to move forward, I do, to let them know they are lovely human beings. My Marie, the daughter with Crohn's, moved to Montreal several years ago. When people asked why she did that, I wished I'd said to escape the draft. <laughs> In truth, she moved because she knew she had to seize that dream while she still had time and did not wait for the money or the right time or even the energy or wisdom to make such a dramatic change in her life. Questioning Marie about her Crohn's initiated awareness of her mortality, I was surprised that she looked so sparingly at both sides of that coin. All the good things you can say about facing your mortality, cleaning up your goals, yet I know some people who are real sad, real jaded. After you've been really sick or in a bad place, all you try to do later is forget it. The negative outcome is that nothing matters because you know nothing matters, because you've been there to that dark, silent place where there is nothing or you're nothing. That knowledge makes some people not want to do anything, get anything done because of meaninglessness. For people with chronic illnesses, not people who have had a momentary experience of near death. It's a scary and awesome realization. When I first realized I had Crohn's and got sick, I hit it hard, worked long hours, went out every night, ran around. Now I know people, especially people with HIV diagnoses, that do no drugs, take vitamins, get plenty of sleep, eat well, and have stable jobs. It's that Zen paradox that nothing matters, and this is still my Marie talking, and yet we are required to do our best, to live as if it all matters. Consciousness of our impending death sure can tighten up your thinking. You have much less time for things that don't matter. You suffer fools less gladly and are less willing to waste time. This daughter's special knowledge leads me to think that we cannot live our lives all the time thinking, oh dear, I'm going to die sooner or later, so I better appreciate my life now. Or maybe we can or should. But we don't, at least I don't. There is the dailiness. There are irritations, frustrations, moments of feeling my life is a big joke, moments of tiredness and despair. Yet the time comes when the sky is exquisitely blue again, when a bird song permeates our consciousness to remind us of beauty, of nature, of joy, when our heart comes back to our work or our nights. Carolyn Heilbrunn wrote a great line in an essay in the New York Times a friend sent to me years ago. In, in encouraging women to live their lives with integrity, and I suppose pizzazz, she laments living another chapter of the heterosexual plot. To this day, whenever I become over-exercised with some minor fault of my husband, I remind myself of her words and try to keep my magnifying, magnificent magnifying mind 
off of somebody else's faults and blind to my own. I ask, is this current upset just another chapter of the heterosexual plot, or is it the storyline and purpose of my life? The answer is always no, and I let my overwrought irritation go and get back to myself. Uh, Heilbrunn also writes in On Mortality, in The Last Gift of Time, Life Beyond 60, perhaps only when we know our pulses, a phrase of Keats, that our time is limited, do we properly treasure it. Well, we should all properly treasure then, should we not? That surely is an enormous gift of old age, illness, or simply the increasing obsession with death and dying. I have pretended that such an obsession was only a passing fancy that it was not present in myself, even though my writings, conversations, and reflections give every indication of that process winding its way through my life for some time. Heilbrunn, Heilbrunn writes, and because I will die before many years are past, those satisfactions have a piercing beauty. She was speaking of the pleasure she takes in friendship with her grown children. The other side of mortality until death comes is, if one is lucky, piercing beauty. The garden in the spring, peonies blooming for Memorial Day, fall coming after a stifling summer, swallows seining bugs across the sky at evening and time to watch them, a lawn scattered with cottonwood leaves, the first tree to drop its leaves in the fall, the prospect of a good book, a telephone call, a trip, a movie, the cat rolling on its back in pleasure on the bricks of the porch, hearing that moment of silence that comes at dusk, new snow softening the edges of everything, a winding road, one's comrades in movements for social justice, the comfort of a long relationship honed in years of learning who the other is, how to live together, and how to be kind to one another, a clean house, a cup of tea in the morning paper, Friends who know you and do not judge, and people who keep our courage up, and yes, I agree, amazing, breathtaking friendships with three grown daughters. Heilbrunn credits that awareness of mortality for teaching her to just dance the steps, as Balanchine said, particularly about marriage. What have I learned in these years of increasingly intense awareness of mortality? That I am not nearly as important as I once thought that age does not soften one's ambition if that has run one for a lifetime as it has me, except that that got taken care of three years ago. Yet now I understand that it might not be satisfied by my effort and that one's shortcomings do not vanish, that I am grateful more for smaller favors, the humility that comes not for the asking but because I have less energy, less strength, less time to plan for the grand gesture and that I can smile instead of become wrought up about some things, that we do live in an absurd world, that I am wiser but do not have to display that wisdom. It comes for the living and is not for sermons, that I still have little judgment about time, planning every day to do twice more than can be accomplished, feeling less bad at bedtime at the undone, and that I am sad at the thought of this life ending, constantly surprised to have come even to the last quarter. Truly, I thought it would last forever. Jeffrey Stokes kept writing in the Village Voice after being diagnosed with a type of cancer that goes very fast and had a very low survival rate. He spoke in one of his columns in the Voice of rereading poet James Merrill's Sandover, opting for earlier Merrill writing before Merrill was in radiation therapy for his terminal cancer. So I quote this Merrill poem. Because once looked at, lit by the cold reflections of the dead, risen in extinct but irresistible, our lives have never seemed more full, more real, nor the full moon more quick to chill. I cannot return enough to those words that contain, contain the exact truth, at least to my eyes and ears, of the journey between birth and death. Awareness of mortality bringing us to cherish our tattered lives, awkwardly lived in a kind of courage-giving melancholy. 
I guess we're still all right on time, aren't we? Okay. I'm going to read you the first part of one on low on some days. And I will not do grieving. It's much too long. And then a, what life is like two years later. That's three years later today. But this is the low on some days. Nearly everything reminds me of death. As I am disabled at age 68 and afraid of the pain of my husband's death, or that of him or our grown children when I die. This sentence struck me early this spring and continues to haunt me. A few years ago, it occurred to us that we might be running low on some days, the writer says. So we spent a week in Sedona and a month in Mexico and went to London three times and took a once in a lifetime, if not now, when safari in Kenya. The point of that eloquent article in Modern Maturity was that the couple eventually went to Portofino, which they had missed in Italy 45 years before. While watching the Mediterranean at Portofino, Leonard asked his wife, Jackie, now that we're here, what road's not taken our left? I don't mean just geography. What challenges haven't we met? She thought a while and replied, I can't think of any, and I can't either, he said, which was a good thing because uh, during that holiday, she suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and then another. She didn't die from either. Despite the obvious seize the day and treasure your loved one's advice that we get almost daily, especially in old age or faced with a cancer or heart scare, or maybe simply recognizing these truths in a new way, I wonder how many some days we might be running low on. Might is hardly the operative word. We are, in fact, running low on some days, even though we do almost exactly what we wish with our days and our time. My husband goes to his office every day and then to his club to play golf with his friends. I spend half of every 24 hours sleeping in recovery from that brain aneurysm and uh, most of the rest of the time going to health appointments and walking or exercising in the water every day or attending to life's minimal errands. We have our first grandchild, beautiful, amazing daughter, child named Charlotte Francesca, who lives with her parents, Amy and Hans, half a country away in Seattle and two other daughters, Anna and her partner Bo in Boston and Marie in Montreal. Thus far in recovery, I travel only with my husband since my vision and brain and body strength are not, listen to me right this a year ago, not yet up to par, <laughs> and probably will not be brain injury often being permanent. Yet I manage amazingly well and worked hard at recovering. After reading those fateful words, running low on some days, I mentioned them to my husband, and he asked me what list I would make. That was pretty surprising because he's not the most conversational person. Delighted to be asked, I gave him my list. A month in London, a month at the ocean at the tip of Cape Cod, time with the girls in Charlotte Francesca, an African safari, and of course, back to Jerusalem and Palestine. Since then, a friend who has gone three times on safari to Africa says the sub-Sahara is too dangerous for innocent tourists right now. So safari may drop off the list or at least down a ways. Just this week, we decided to go with friends. This was last, just this last spring. We went on a no heavy lifting tour, we thought, to Cairo, up the Nile to see the monuments out to the Sinai and then across to Jordan and the ruins of Petra. I will go on the Jerusalem extension uh, allowing myself not to follow the group and to play hooky for a time with my Palestinian friends. Well, the trip was much too hard for the four old folks who went together, all that walking around the desert and looking at tombs and temples. And the Jerusalem extension was canceled, <laughs> needless to say. We are certainly running low on some days. I am reminded of an exercise we do in values clarification classes. Um, we list 12 things we want to not regret not having done. That's a little harder than, what do I want to do before I die? These lists, tucked away in a file, file drawer that I make along with the class, even when I'm leading the class, were done without anything other than that rather cerebral knowledge that our lives are finite, our time is lim limited, and we better get at what we love now. Since the shock of a brain aneurysm rendered me unconscious for a few days and hospitalized for a month, and a year and a half later, still finds me on the injured list three years later, still on the injured list. I think death is around the corner. Talking to an old friend who had serious heart problems a few years ago, I am comforted to know that he too, for quite a while after his brush with death, 
thought he would die any moment. Eventually, that faded back into the simple knowledge that he would die sometime, not a daily knowing. His wife died last fall after a long struggle with cancer, so he has spent years dealing with death and life at the same time. Perhaps we all do under the surface of our busyness, our addictions, our trivial pursuits, our ambitions, and our neuroses. My old lists concern just myself, wanting to be fluent in Spanish, getting more manuscripts off to publishers, learning not to be so busy. That learning was done for me. The low on some days that grips me now is for us. What roads not taken or missed opportunities? In Gross's words, the writer, holes in our life together that we would someday like to patch. Surely we could do that month in London together if we can afford it, but a month at the ocean and going to Palestine are not on my husband's list of things he wants to do. Um, two years ago this coming March, we joined his friends in California for a golfing month for him. It was, I thought I would have these long afternoons and evenings to walk and read and sleep and my sister had different ideas about how to spend that time. <laughs> Our some days will undoubtedly include another such effort at, at a golfing vacation. But where do we go from there? What are our favorite things now? Evenings after supper on the back porch watching swallows sail across the night sky? Quiet times in the living room, each of us reading errands and fussing done for the day? The NBA basketball season on television? an occasional Saturday or Sunday night supper with old friends, visits from and to our three daughters and their families. All the, oh, these are more enjoyable for me since the girls and I talk together continuously and intensely, leaving a silent husband and father more silent and wondering where the peaceful house went. What do we want to do in these low on some days days? More of the above, interspersed with geographic adventures, do we want to update our wills? Arrange Amy's wedding pictures in the album bought for that two years ago? Clean the separate and crowded dusty closets and cupboards of our offices of old papers and things? Fill our yard with perennials that's being, that is on my list for those summers that my gardener husband is no longer here. I long for the joy of loafing and writing and walking through unscheduled days. Time with Charlotte and good time with Amy Anna and Beau and Marie. Good talks with friends like we have at Quaker Potluck, which I attend irregularly since being struck down. If we had all the time in the world, what would we do? Playwright Christopher Fry wrote, if we all knew we had 30 minutes to live, we would tie up all the telephone lines in the world calling each other to say, I love you. What would we do if we took seriously that our time is limited? When his life's work was threatened, St. Ignatius Loyola was asked what he would do if Pope Paul IV dissolved the Society of Jesus. He replied, I would pray for 15 minutes and then I would not think of it again. Another version has him answering, I'd pray for 15 minutes and then go on hoeing. What risks do we need to take? What business needs finishing up? Or may we just go on hoeing? In his book, All the Damned Angels, William Mool writes, of the sudden, keen, angry awareness of the frail, frailty of our tenure among all that we have come to love. Could I have finished my allotted days by making a gratitude list each day? By writing half of the time? By figuring out how to live in today, not in all the tomorrows and future plans? How not to be a bitter old woman? Learn to take the bus about my town? Figure out how not to hate the Israelis for what they have done to the Palestinians and their country. See the end of the death penalty in the US. Come to terms with being a middle class person aesthetically mourning poverty and pain the world around. Maybe I will learn to be quiet and happy staying home and become enamored of baseball on television and not agonize over the absurdities and cruelties of the world. Could I learn to live more lightly and less violently in the world, doing my part toward that world peace and justice I so fervently believe in? Okay, we will not do grieving, but we will do life nearly two years later. I think we're okay on time. Okay, 
struggling one day to explain to my neurofeedback therapist how I spill food on me and on the table when I eat. This particular time at the home luncheon table of a Palestinian friend who is a great cook and dismayed at my loss of table manners. I, I wiggled and stretched my fingers in the front of my face and said, in all seriousness, you'd think I'd had a stroke. And then I sat and wept. Nearly two years later, I could finally say the words. You'd think I had a stroke. It is a terrible yet freeing realization. Now I don't have to act like someone who is really well, except for having that unfortunate aneurysm, fortunately, that did not burst and left me alive and functioning. Having an aneurysm let me float above, in my mind, people who have a stroke. At the rehab, ha rehab hospital, I refused to attend the weekly noon meeting of a stroke survivors group, feeling myself better than those poor people, left with guttural speech and spastic movements of their limbs. I flinched whenever my youngest daughter referred to my stroke. I didn't discuss it with her. I just figured she had her own strange reasons for using that word. All this, even though months before I had asked nurse Carol McShane the difference between a stroke and an aneurysm. She told me there are two kinds of strokes, one where the blood vessel is blocked usually by a blood clot, and the other where a blood vessel in the brain begins bleeding or bursts to a too thin mem through a too thin membrane wall. That's an aneurysm. I didn't tumble yet. Now when I remember, I say over and over again to myself, I had a stroke. I breathe deeply and I feel sad, but less driven to prove how well I am. More able to think of myself as a survivor of a stroke, still and probably always having to live with the effects of that. No wonder I seem not to be getting stronger, despite exercising an hour every day. No wonder my fine motor skills allow me to spill food a lot. No wonder I still cannot bear too much stimulation, noise, busyness, bright fluorescent lights, too many things going on at once, crowds, intensity, these lights. No heavenly wonder I have begun to want to do less, to schedule less, to take on less, to stay home more. I look and read back over what I did that first year, that first chapter grandly cataloging everything I did in the first eight months thinking that it could just add up and add up and continue to be more. That was still in the time of my denial. Yet I wonder, how could my denial have been so strong? How could I have thought that aneurysm, that the form of stroke that altered my life and left me brain injured, would someday be gone? Perhaps I needed that cocoon of denial, that illusion I lived in for nearly two years. I have become my own expert on what life can be, what living with brain injury is like and what limitations are now the outer limits of my days. I am no longer waiting for the other shoe to fall nor for life to get better or to return to that life I knew well for 67 years. Life has in fact gotten better and I am grateful for the learnings provided by this stroke. Do not take me wrong, I do not give thanks for having had a stroke. I simply find this new way of life interesting in a sneaky and difficult way to have learned humility, my limitations and my powerlessness. My spirit has become stronger as I accept all the strange permutations of life after all death. My husband checked out my eyes recently, his frequent test, and finding them better, the one severely affected now able to see straight ahead and said, you're not brain injured, we're both just getting old. <laughs> well, there are some uh, enormous comparisons between brain injury and aging. One happens instantly and one takes a long time. But no matter what he thinks in order to protect his own fragile sense of aging and weakening self, I know frequently several times a day that I am brain injured and how hard that is. I spill, I forget not just the last word, but names of people I've known all my life. I get tired so fast, I stutter, I use wrong words, I hear the wrong word, I can't stand busy places or crowds continually think I can do more than I can and can hardly bear anymore the infrequent visitor or caller who simply wants to rave how good I look about how good I look and how fortunate I am to be alive. I assure such people that I am indeed grateful, which I am. 
Oddly, it feels, feels somewhat comforting to tell myself I had a stroke and must live with that from now on. The waiting to get better, although possible, is indeed over. I think forever I will see and feel my hands and fingers moving in front of my eyes, trying to explain what finally came tumbling out. You'd think I had a stroke. Now I can get on with this life, knowing and loving my disabled as a given, rather than something to be gotten over or ignored or criticized or embarrassed about. It feels like a gift of life, this bewildering damage to my brain that demands I live more consciously, more slowly, more carefully, more honestly. Two last quick things. Lovely, radical newspaper columnist Molly Ivins has gone through breast cancer chemotherapy and is now well. She reports from that experience, the trouble is I'm not a better person. I was in great hopes that confronting my own mortality would make me deeper, more thoughtful. There was not a single iota of spiritual improvement or growth, she writes. <laughs> Cancer doesn't do that, Ivan says. Cancer means being mutilated, poisoned, and burned. It is her recovery that holds the magic for Ivan's. She says, I am so grateful now, it's a matter of priorities. After cancer, there are no more bad hair days. I shall send that to my oldest daughter, whom I inundated with all the latest cancer books more than a year ago as she went through radiation for breast cancer. Later I read, probably in Ivan's column, that cancer patients need laughter and mystery novels, not tomes about their illness. I also hope that I have come to this side of near death with the kind of joy and humility that Ivan's evidences. Maybe even, even her radiance and laughter in the face of both life and death. This other leftover, which I think of as another mantra to all these reflections on death and dying. A lovely woman in our town died rapidly from cancer about a year after my hip aneurysm transit. I was glad to be well enough to attend her memorial service at the Unitarian Church. The pastor, Charles Stevens, said all the right things, and now I'm quoting from Charles. Each of us is unprecedented, unrepeatable, and unique. We are met here this sunny afternoon so conscious of that essential human truth, unprecedented, unrepeatable, and unique. We are met here, this family and these friends, because Marge has died. But more truthfully, we are here because she lived, and because in minor and major ways her life touched our own. He went on to lovingly and accurately describe this woman, concluding by reminding us, but she was mortal and she knew it. Life is given to us only on the condition of death. And while some may protest that condition, the wise person will have early in life accepted the terms and gone on to live life as fully as possible. We are fragile creatures who do not have forever. The universe that sustains us will someday bring our lives to an end. We deal with that reality by living fully in the time that is given to us. To front the essential facts of life, as Charles quoted Thoreau, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. Would we all not say yes and amen to those words? We fragile creatures living fully in the time that is given us. Thank you. I think we're done.